I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 13 this morning. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to dive into this chapter. And my hope is that we'll get through all 18 verses, but we'll see what happens. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about <clears throat> this morning the satanic partnership, the axis of evil, all those earthly forces that have come alongside that of the dragon and Satan in, those, in these end times, in future days that will be capable of mass destruction with um, a seduction and a seduction as well as deception of the world. And this forces will, will mount themselves against that of the coming Christ and fly in the face of the sovereignty of God. And so this morning we kind of looking at this chapter that really unfolds what's going behind the scenes again. Last couple of weeks we've been looking at Satan and uh, what uh, the dragon is about. This morning we're going to be looking at the beast as well as the false prophet. And so uh, let's open our time in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for the encouragement that we can find in your word. For it does teach us about enemies. It does teach us about your enemies. It teaches us about falsehood. It teaches us about false prophecy. It teaches us about Satan and all of his minions all of his forces that are, are waged ultimately against you, but are continually spilling out and, and confronting uh, the people of God as well. And so this morning, help us to, to understand, help us not to, to fear, but help us to understand the foes that uh, are, are put before us even in our day, and those that are to come. So, Father, help us to, to understand that, that you are victorious. Lord, that, that you have inflicted the fatal blow against Satan and all of his forces. And yet, just like a wounded animal, he's still flailing about and seeking to harm all that, that he can. And so, Father, help us to be directed to, to put on the armor that we have in Christ and help us, Father, to, to take up truth and, and, to be, uh, and not to be deceived, but help us uh, by teaching us the truth. And so, Father, help us to understand these things, some of these things difficult, more difficult to understand, and so give us discernment as we look at these passages. And again, help us to, to understand your foe, help us to understand our foe, that we might stand in you and in Christ against all that would seek to undermine your sovereignty and seek to usurp your lordship. In your name we pray, amen. <clears throat> so the axis of evil this morning. Again, uh, we, we started a few weeks ago as we dove into chapter 12 looking at the dragon. The dr dragon, that uh, horrifying picture of this monster who's been waging war against God and against his people for centuries. 
It, it said it started sometime but before the fall and is raging all the way and is going to meet its end here in the book of Revelation quickly. But before its end, we will really see the, the, the uh, furiousness and the rage of God's enemy. And God's enemy is, is, is multitude. It's not just Satan, but it is also the Antichrist. It is also the false prophet. Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24, 24. He said, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect, telling us again, how disruptive, how destructive, and how sneaky and deceptive these forces will be and are. Passages like Matthew 24, as well as uh, uh, throughout the New Testament, warn us. There is a Antichrist that is the ultimate form, the ultimate person who is yet to come, and whom we'll talk about here in the book of Revelation. But there are many precursors, many antichrists, many who would stand and, and be a part of this ancient war, uh, warring against the gospel, warring against Christ, putting on the, the facade of light, and, and yet... Uh, a, a ministry of deception and destruction. Second John, Second John 7 says this, For many deceivers have come out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver, the Antichrist. So again, there are, in a sense, there are many Antichrists. Just as there are many false teachers, false prophets. And the church is to confront them. The church is to, to teach and instruction and, and, and to discipline those. To correct those in opposition and to stand firm for the faith once delivered to the saints. We are to contend for the truth. And so as we look at Revelation this morning, I want you to see that, I want you to understand not only what the Antichrist is all about, his characteristics and so forth, and the false prophet as well. We're going to look at his characteristics, what he's going to do ultimately there in the end times and how he is a part of the axis of evil and, and all of that. But I want you to keep in your forefront and your in mind that we in the church age, we in the here and now are to contend. We, we are to fight. We are in the middle of this war. And so we're to carry ourselves about in that way. We are to stand for truth. Because truth matters. We ought to be one who is careful in doctrine and instruction and teaching. Because theology matters. Truth matters. And we live in a day and age that has just really just thrown that out. And, and many even calling themselves believers have given way to this worldly idea that there could somehow be truth that is up to the individual, measured by the individual. So it's your truth and my truth. And so everything is subjective according to the self. But this is just downright wrong. It's wrong, and it's a part of the deception that is going to go on in the end times, and it is the part of the deception and the, and the practices of Satan and all of the access of evil in the here and now. And so we are to stand for truth. And this is always a, 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 a careful thing for a pastor. It is always a, a thing that I think quite a lot about, because 
There are so many things that aren't true out there. We could spend day in and Sunday and Sunday after Sunday talking about false teachers, naming them and, and, uh, and trying to correct their error and so forth. But the best way to defend the truth is to proclaim it. I love what John MacArthur said one time. He says, you just need to let the lion out. He could defend himself. And so we, we need to let the truth out. We need to proclaim the truth. We need to stand for the truth. And we, we, we forever need to engage in this way. Because our enemy has come and he is here now and he will be even more manifest in the future. Bringing lies and deception. Partial truth. And it's going to have an awful impact into the world. It's going to lead many, many astray. So we need to be awakened to the fact that there are, even now, false Christs, false prophets. 1 John 2, 18 says this, Children, it is the last hour. Just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared for this we know that this is the last hour. And so we are in this last times where antichrists have been. And we can look back in history. And, 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 the, and church history is full of people that, that the church has said, well, maybe this is the antichrist. And yet history keeps going on. We know that those are those uh, people that are manifesting uh, the, the preliminaries. They're, they're manifesting little Antichrist, if you will. And the Antichrist is yet to come. Same with false prophet. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of the false prophets whom come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And we're going to see the false prophet here talked about today who is... A lamb with horns. He's a beast. Though he comes very subtle. Though he comes very seductive. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says this. But false prophets arose among the people. Just as there will also be false teachers among you. Who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, denying the master who brought the, bought them, being swift destruction, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. So just a warning. Where did all of the cults come from? They came out from the church. And so we must contend with error. We must take doctrine seriously. We must take theology seriously. 1 John 4, verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have come out into the world. And so one of the things that day in and day out on every Sunday, I want you to understand, you, you must come with open Bible. And you must be like the Bereans of old. And you must search the scripture to see if these things are true. It does not matter who is up here. It does not matter who is on the internet. It does not matter who is on the YouTube channel or on the radio. Truth proclaimed needs to be tested through the absolute truth of the word of God. And so we must be careful in what we listen to. We must be careful in uh, what we understand, what we lay claim to. We must be discerning and we must be praying for discernment continually. And so with that in mind, I want us to dive into the careers of Satan's partners. His axis of evil, if you will. They, Capable of mass destruction. Capable of, of mass destruction. And, and uh, <clears throat> just want to remind you 
That, that, that false teaching has a way of, of, destruct, of, of, of mass destruction in that way. Because it's carry on, carried on and it's taught and it's perpetuated. And so we must be, uh, we must be careful in, in that regard. So let's look this morning first at the Antichrist. This is the beast. This morning we're going to look at the Antichrist, the beast, the beast that is belching out blasphemy. The beast that is belching out blasphemy. We'll look at verses 1 through 10 on that. And we're going to see three characteristics. And then we'll move down and we'll look at the false prophet. The puppet priest peddling propaganda. I got carried away with my alliterations. Hopefully that will make it stick. All right. So let's look at that beast, that beast that is belching out blasphemy. Three characteristics as we look at our text this morning. Uh, the first off is <clears throat> the position of dictatorship. He is a world leader. He is the, the pinnacle of politician. He, he has amassed the world's forces and they are beginning then to, to listen to him. He is ruling over them all as a dictator. He has found that position. He's been given that position by the prince of the power of the, uh, of the air. Look at verse 1 there. <clears throat> and the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And then I saw a beast coming out of the sea having ten horns and seven heads, and on his, thorn, on, his, uh, on his horns were ten diadems, and on his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet was like a bear, and his mouth was like a lion, and his dragon gave him his power and his throne great Authority, And so this Antichrist that is yet to come will, will yield much authority. Hey, he will have brought the kingdoms and the nations together. And, and it starts out, <clears throat> uh, verse 1, saying where this beast comes from, he comes out of the sea. There's a terrifying look to him. And this will be contrasted, by the way, with the false prophet who's got more of an appealing, sort of timid, sort of a, a, a cozy feel to him. No, the beast is, is a raging creature, much like the dragon. And the dragon then stood on the, the seashore, and he calls, presumably, to this great leader, this great world leader, who be the arch enemy of the people of God throughout the tribulation period. The Antichrist there came out of the sand of the seashore, referring to the nations. By this expression, we can see that he is most likely a Gentile. He comes out of the nations, out of the sand of the seashore. It says an expression describing the nations. And... uh, We see this beast coming out of the sea. Revelation 11 verse 7. When they had given, when they had finished their testimony that a beast that came out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Uh, It seems these are, these are, these are beasts. These are partners in crime. These are, these are uh, uh, compelled out of the nations To wage war with God's people and ultimately against our Lord. Uh, This beast also has reference to the demon that ascended from the abyss. And will also powerfully dominate the human antichrist. And uh, be powered by Satan. This beast is powered by Satan. And we'll, we'll see that in, later on in Revelation 17, more, even more clearly. The Antichrist then has such a, a, a dual uh, personages of human and demonic. 
He personifies that demonic kingdom, that satanic kingdom, that worldly kingdom. He has ten horns and seven heads. His, his horns had diadems on them. And, the he- and his heads were, had blasphemous names on them. Again, this is a world leader. The picture of diadems, the picture of the different heads. He he has become this one world leader described here. And this is very similar to the description of Satan that we looked at in in, uh, chapter 12, verse, uh, verse 3. The great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And on his heads were seven diadems. And so this is Satan's man. This is Satan's man. They, 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 are, uh, they, they, are, they are partners. They are partners. They are allies in their war against God and against his people. The reference to ten horns and seven heads corresponds to Daniel 7. We don't have the time there to go there, but you see tracking down with Daniel 7 and this text, we see that the lion here has reference to the Babylonian Empire. The bear has a reference to the Medo-Persian Empire. The leopard has a designation of the, of the Greek Empire under Alexandria. And the fourth beast of Daniel described in Daniel 7, is indescribable. And this is the beast here. This is the Antichrist, foreshadowed by the Roman Empire. The the power and the authority to uh, accomplish this totalitarian, totalitarian rule is granted by Satan. See the text there. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority you say how is it that that one man would rise to prominence that one man would be able to to oversee all of the nations and 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 claim such a uh, a, a dictatorship and, and many throughout history have come close but satan powered by satan this antichrist figure this coming dictator will and so that's his position look at his promotion there in verses uh, three and four and then i saw the heads as if it had come be, had been slain a fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast and they worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast who was able to wage war with him. And so this beast, uh, this beast, this antichrist, political uh, dictator, totalitarian uh, leader, extraordinaire, starts off, we look at Daniel 9, and apparently he's involved in confirming a covenant with many for a week, it says, and and, um, and then that covenant is broken. And somewhere in the midst of this career, he, he gets a fatal blow, blow. And it is said that he died, and all of a sudden he comes back. And commentators are, uh, commentators are divided as to whether or not this is a fake death, uh, part of a deception of Satan. But whatever the case may be here, it is the platform for which this person then rises and is promoted to even more admiration and ultimately worship. John MacArthur has something to say about this. He says, uh, whether this death is real or fake, it's not clear. It, It may be that the Antichrist is really killed and God and his own purposes allows him to be resurrected. More likely, the Antichrist's uh, <clears throat> alleged death and resurrection will be a counterfeit of Christ's death and resurrection staged as one of the lying wonders perpetuated by the false prophet. 
So it's not clear as to whether or not this is a real death, but you understand this is a real person. And the whole world is under the impression that he did die. And that under the power of Satan, he rose. And he rose to prominence. He was promoted in this way. And the whole earth is amazed and and follows after the beast. And so all of those in the world, the whole earth, it says in verse 4, followed after the beast. That's the ultimate end of this popularity, the ultimate end of this promotion, the ultimate end of this staged event, most likely. This deception it is to lead others to, to worship Satan, to, to uh, lead others in the whole world to, to, to worship this Antichrist figure. And the worship that is offered to the Antichrist at this point is totally blasphemous. Look at the phrase there in verse 4. Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? All right, we could go after passage after passage. Exodus 15, Psalm 35, Isaiah 40, Micah 7. And this phrase gets turned on its end and inside out. Who is like the Lord, it should read. And who is able to reach war against God? That's what the phrase should read. But no, the deception and the seduction and the promotion that has happened and the political uh, clout that, is, that has come to be with this Antichrist figure. Now the whole world, all of those unbelievers in the world are rising up and they're saying, no, it's not the Lord. It's the beast. Who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? And there is a little irony Tied to that phrase, by the way. Because God is. That's who. The only sovereign one. The great I am. He is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. This is the the message of revelation in totality. It is Jesus Christ. He is the great victor. God is the one. Who cannot be opposed. God is the one to whom you better not go to war with. But no, the whole world has fallen under the instruction of the Antichrist. And he's been, he he has this position of dictatorship. He has a promotion of admiration and and, and ultimately worship. He's being worshipped and all this and the false prophet, as we'll see, fanning that flame of false worship. We come to the third characteristic of the Antichrist here is the purpose of domination. The purpose of domination. Again, Satan's worst fear. And Satan knows he is going to lose, but his worst fear is to to lose his place of of domination, his, his, his place of lordship, that is, his place on the earth as the prince of the power of the air. He fears this most of all, and so he has called out this Antichrist from the sands of the sea, this awful abomination. And so in verse 5 through 10, you see this, his great purpose. His great purpose here is to speak arrogant words and, and blasphemous and do blasphemous things. To acquire the worship of all who are on the earth. In verse 10, then I heard a loud voice. Excuse me, I'm in chapter 10. Chapter 13, if anyone, verse 10, excuse me, verse 5, there is given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words, chapter 13, verse 5. 
There is given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemous, blasphemous, and the authority to act for 42 months was given to him. And so the Lord, again, with every step, and we saw this with, with the dragon, dragon wants to do, he wants to bring total destruction, but, but Christ and sovereignty of God uh, thwarts him and, and stops him short. We'll only let this beast's leash go out thus far. And so in this time of tribulation, the purpose of, of this Antichrist is to spew these great blasphem, blasphemies, arrogant words, and this, these words that fly in the face of, of God, these words that essentially place Satan on the throne. And the Antichrist on the throne, belittling the God of the universe, the God of creation. And we are told that he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God. And blasphemed the name and his temple, and that is those who dwell on or dwell in heaven. He blasphemed his name, that is the entire person of God. That is who he is. He is usurping worship. Blaspheming God's name by taking his place. He's blaspheming, he's belching out these blasphemous words. He blasphemes his temple, that is, the saints and the angels and all who are in heaven. He is going to replace the worship and the, the rightful church of God and the worship of his people. And his ultimate goal is to totally replace that with something that is going to divert people to Satan. Going to divert them to falsehood. Going to divert them to the Antichrist. And to his ultimate control. And look down at verses 7 and 8. The domination there in verses 7 and 8 of the Antichrist. And it was given to him to make war with the saints to overcome them and the authority over every tribe, people, tongue, and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him and everyone whose name is not written in the foundation of the world, uh, of the world, world in the book of, the, of life in the Lamb who has been slain. And so the domination of the Gentiles, all the Antichrists, ascends to, the, to, to control and to manipulate and to dominate all the forces of the world, the authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation, and it was given to him. That's a very important phrase, because it was given to him. It wasn't taken from God, it was given to him. God giving that beast just a little leash for a time. God gives him freedom to exercise this authority, the sovereign power to, to save all men from these people. Groups has already been demonstrated. God is going to be able to thwart Satan. As we looked at uh, that last week, but there is a time, again, when the Antichrist will come and he will exercise great dominion over the earth. And we're told that all of the non-elect, a group who's is called here those who dwell on the earth. Again, that phrase, those who are yet unbelieving. And they will worship, all who dwell on the earth will worship him. Everyone whose name is not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. That is Christ. So if your name is not written in the Lamb's book of life, if you are not a believer, then you are going to fall under the deception of the Antichrist. 
and of Satan. Unbelief and rejection, always indication that peoples whose names are not written in the book of life. So there's that distinction there. In verses 9 through 10, we see the destruction of the godly. That is, he is going to chase after the Antichrist, is going to continue like Satan to hunt down those who are godly at this time. Verse 7, it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them to some degree. God instructs his followers to yield to the providence of God and not to fight the Antichrist. If anyone here, if anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, to captivity he goes. If anyone kills with the sword, with the sword he must be killed. The wicked regime of the Antichrist is seen as deceiving the authority as receiving the authority, excuse me, to persecute and to execute capital punishment even against God's elect. And God is essentially saying, listen, if you're not in that bubble we talked about as the Jews fled Israel and into the wilderness and God divinely protected them, there will be those believers who are sprinkled all over the world and satanic forces Uh, The Antichrist is going to chase them down and going to hunt them and going to imprison them. And some of them are going to be martyred. And so, if anyone has ears, let them hear. He said, this is is going to happen. It's going to happen for a time. If anyone is destined to captivity, he's going to go into captivity. He's going to be killed. He's, He's going to be killed. And yet there is perseverance and the faith of the saints. Ultimately, God is going to preserve the soul and spirit of those, even those who die by the hand, the executioner's hands during these uh, difficult, difficult days. So it's hard to imagine, but maybe it's not. As you see, this, this Antichrist ruler, this one who brings a, 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 a domineering, political, um, captivates the attention of all of the nations and brings them together into this one world nation. Well, for generations and generations, the churches would see these kinds of things and they'd say, how, how can this be? And you and I live in a world where we say, well, that that's, doesn't seem that far away. It doesn't seem that far away at all. And we have seen throughout history men's ability to, to uh, take up war and to take up politics and to, to move men with, 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 with great oratory and to manipulate men with, with military might. And yet this Antichrist will be the pinnacle of that. But he will have help. He will have help. And his help will come from the false prophet. That puppet priest peddling propaganda. We would all know about propaganda. This priest practices false teaching and practices manipulation and, and, and practices uh, and, and, and is really the backup for and compelling others to believe in the Antichrist. And I think the better part of wisdom for me is to save this one till next week. <laughs> you didn't think I could get through a whole chapter, did you? Um. <clears throat> As we look at this Antichrist, as we look at this false, uh, false priest, this, this, uh, this prophet that is coming, again, just reminds us, our enemy is real. Our enemy is real. Our, our foe is serious. And, and yet, God is sovereign. He, he, he will stop 
Satan short every time so that his purposes will be fulfilled. This will be a horrible time to live on the earth. This will be a horrible time to experience, but yet it will be a time where God still is sovereign. He is holding these evil forces, this axis of evil, only to do that which he allows for his purposes. The raging of the raging of the world's mindset, the raging of the world's false doctrine and false teaching, and it brings brings it to this nth degree. We see people in our country talking about, you know, the, the freedom of all of these uh, ideas and, and all of these uh, teachings that they bring forth. And, and oh, wow, it's such a great idea. And you know what? God allows the world to go that far to realize that, listen, all that don't fall under the lordship of Christ will have this end. To let the leash out long enough to know, listen, if you go down this road, this is the end. It it leads to a totalitarian dictator. That it will only bring maliciousness. Vindictiveness. Will only bring wrath and hatred and death and destruction. And that's what sin does. That's what rebellion against the Lordship of Christ does. It does so in the life of individuals. It does so in the life of any one nation. And it will do so ultimately in the world. And the book of Revelation here tells us this is what's coming. Not only for us to know that which is coming, but also to understand. To understand when we're confronted with the world saying, well, you know, all we need to do is, is get together. All we need to do is, is exercise our own right. All we need to do is that which is right in our own eyes. All we need to do is rebel against God. All we need to do is take up our own lordship. No, this is the end. This is what it brings. And this is why God lets the leash out this far. To let us see what the end of sin is. To let us see and behold with our own eyes what rebellion will truly bring. Well, next week we're going to look at this false prophet more carefully. But we've seen the Antichrist belching out blasphemies. As you're reading the entire book of of Revelation and reading about the risen Christ and the honor of Christ and, and, and all that Christ is bringing about to put down the usurper. And this is the backstory. This is all that the usurper would bring to fight against the Lord, that ancient, ancient foe. So let us be aware. Let us not be deceived. Well, we're, we're not just twiddling our thumbs here, gentlemen, ladies. We are in a battle. We are engaged. And we need to act as such. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, help us to understand. Help us to understand this spiritual battle that we are in. Help us to understand that when we confront false teaching and false prophets, how serious a matter that is. And so help us to be bold. Help us to know the truth so well that it stands out when error enters in. Help us to be discerning. Lord, help us to understand that anything that opposes your lordship Father, we should be dead set against. We are yours. And we take comfort in that. And so while we talk about this excess of, excess of evil, Father, we thank you that you, you are sovereign. Yes. You are ruler. And Father, you are the one 
in whom we can hide. We can cling to the cross of Christ. We can cling to your lordship and we are protected and we are sustained and we will persevere because Christ is the ultimate victor. We thank you for that in Christ's name. Amen.